I live alone in an apartment in Utah. My area is fairly metropolitan, and it's not uncommon to see unhoused people near my building. Since I'm a single woman, I am usually more cautious about locking doors and setting alarms than my friends with roommates. I have a simple safe alarm system and two deadbolt locks on my door. Because my area has lots of break-ins, I'm always sure to always lock everything no matter what. Two nights ago, I came home late from a night out with friends, but I was sober. I made sure to lock everything and set alarms like usual. When I woke up the next morning, I heard somebody in my house. They were wearing shoes and just walking around. One of my friends has the code to my alarm, but none of my friends have a key. I'm the only person I know of with the key to the second deadbolt on my door. Not even my landlord has one. I lean my head out the door of my bedroom, which is just a few feet from the more open living room area where the sound was coming from. There was a man in my kitchen. He was about six feet tall and maybe forty years old. He was wearing a full suit and tie, but seemed really tired or drunk. He was standing by my fridge and eating leftovers out of Tupperware and just kind of staring. And I ducked back into my room and called 911. For the next 10 minutes, I stood by my bedroom door and listened to this man eat a bunch of my food from my fridge. When he was done with something, he would just drop the container on the floor. And when the police showed up, both deadbolts were still locked. They knocked on the door and the man in my apartment answered. The police rushed him and yelled if I was okay. When I came out of the bedroom, they had the man pinned to the floor. I saw that he had rearranged the furniture in my living room. There were containers all over my floor. The man wasn't saying anything, and he didn't even say anything to the police when they were asking him questions. After they took him away, the officer told me that the man had business cards in his wallet. He works at a bank downtown. The weirdest thing is that my alarm was set and my deadbolts were locked from the inside, even when he was in my apartment. None of the windows were unlocked or even open. I have no idea how he got in. I have been in back and forth correspondence with the lead investigator. We were finally able to talk Thursday about what exactly happened. The man who broke in was called Jake. On Tuesday of this week, the lead investigator of my case, Nelson, emailed me with this message, amongst other things. And it read, Don't let anybody wearing a hard hat into your apartment. I called him and asked if I could meet with him. He told me he was busy with several cases and would only be able to meet me on Thursday of this week. We emailed back and forth late into Tuesday night and into Wednesday. I would email him back immediately, but it would sometimes take a few hours for him to respond. In one of his follow-up emails, he told me that the man who had gotten into my house never worked at the bank in town. They had tracked the business cards to another person entirely. Additionally, the man who broke into my house is unable to speak. On Wednesday night, all the tenants in my building received a message that light construction work would be going on for the next few days to repair wiring and plumbing. I told my landlord in a message back, that an investigator into my case has requested for me to deny access to any person wearing a hard hat into my apartment. My landlord told me there would be no reason for the construction crew to enter my apartment, as all the work they were doing was in the community access breaker boxes in the basement beneath the building. A few hours later, I get a knock on my door. It was around 10.15pm. When I looked through the peephole, there was a man in a denim jumpsuit standing outside my door. He wasn't wearing a hard hat, but he had on a tool belt and appeared to be some kind of construction worker. I asked him what he needed, and he said he needed to check the pipes in my bathroom. I asked him why he needed to be doing that at 10.15pm. He said they were trying to get all the rooms while the water was already turned off. I asked him if he could contact my landlord on speakerphone, so that I knew he was legit. And instead of complying, he grew angry and told me he was just doing his job. I told him he wasn't allowed to come into my apartment. I would not be opening it for him. I then stepped back into my bedroom and phoned Nelson. He didn't respond, but I left him a message. I then called 911 and informed them of my situation, asking if they could come by and check on the workers. The dispatcher told me she would send somebody to my building. 
I then called my landlord and told her somebody was trying to get into my apartment in a construction outfit. She told me the team had left several hours before. I went back to the door and looked through the people, and of course he was gone. When the police showed up about 20 minutes later, they couldn't find the man anywhere in the building. However, in the video of our entrance near the mailboxes, the man was seen entering the building at around 10pm. Early the next morning on Thursday, Nelson called me and asked if I could meet him at the police station. When I got there, Nelson walked me back to his office. He had an iPad on his desk and a plastic three-ring binder like I used to use in school. I kind of hoped for a classic manila folder, but oh well. He opened the binder and flipped through some pages before settling and looking at me. Nelson told me that the man who had gotten into my apartment was named Jake. Jake's unable to speak, but he's fluent in American Sign Language. He can hear perfectly fine, and he usually carries a notebook with him to write in for those who can't sign. Nelson then told me how Jake got into my apartment, and what the deal with the construction worker was. Jake went missing in mid-December. He works for the Nevada Department of Transportation. Until December last year, Jake was a fairly respected family man. In his teens, he had been addicted to drugs, but he had kicked the habit and started working for the DOT. In the next couple of decades, Jake got married, had a child, and lived fairly comfortably. However, he had a relapse in December for unknown reasons, and soon after, he had disappeared. There were videos of him acting strangely at gas stations where he had used his credit card in the days after his disappearance, but then he stopped using his card after that. There's a two-week period where they're not sure what happened with Jake. The next time Jake showed up was in Utah, where I live. He was cited for a minor vehicle infraction. The next time they saw Jake was in my apartment. After they took him to the station, they had a long conversation with him where they would talk. He would write, and then they would talk again. Jake failed to make sense to the investigators. He wrote about being hungry and not being able to sleep. And when they asked him how he got into my apartment, he would write about how he didn't need any help. Eventually, Nelson was able to get the story from Jake. So during his few weeks in Utah, Jake had started going to bars and meeting some blue-collar workers in the area. He got onto a road construction job from his past DOT experience, and he met another drug addict named Patrick. He and Patrick both used hard drugs. Patrick has been known to get into apartments by posing as a construction worker. He has sold stolen goods from apartments to pay for his habit. The night Jake got into my apartment, he was wearing a suit. His method of breaking in was to look nice enough for somebody to just let him through the entrance. After that, he would enter any unlocked apartment, step out of the window, and then come in through a neighbor's window. Apparently one of my windows has a broken latch. It cannot be properly locked. I also don't have sensors on my windows, so that explains why the alarm never went off. When Jake entered my apartment, he had already been to several other apartments. He was high while doing this, and he was hungry from several hours of sneaking around. He decided to go into my fridge and start eating. As Nelson understands it, Jake became drunk just by going through my fridge and eating and drinking. They also said the original owner of the business cards lives in my building. Jake had stolen the business card case from the entrance of the man's apartment. Nelson said Patrick would likely hit the same apartments as Jake at some point, so it didn't surprise him that Patrick showed up at my apartment not long after Jake did. Nelson said he would be contacting me eventually for the trial, and that it might be a good idea to intensify security in my apartment until they catch Patrick. So this happened in 2016 when I was 17 years old. I was a first year college student in film school. I lived alone in my first ever apartment. It was really small, but I was really proud of my independence. I never felt unsafe in this apartment for several reasons. There were multiple gates to get into the residence that needed to be opened through a code, and only the people who lived there knew it, and my door had three different locks. It was right next to the university, 
So most people who lived in the neighborhood were college students. Nothing bad ever happened in the neighborhood before. I have always been very careful with locking doors when I leave my home. I always check twice. So this one time, I leave to go to class and lock my door, but for some reason I couldn't get my key out of the lock. It was completely stuck. I went to get the caretaker of the building, but he wasn't there, and I was already running late for my class. So I went to class with the key still on the lock. When I got home, the caretaker was back, so he came to help me out. We couldn't get it out for like 15 minutes until somehow he did. He told me that the lock was damaged, but I didn't necessarily need to change it. I only needed to lock it once instead of twice. I just said okay, and that was the end of it. I really wasn't worried because of how safe I felt in the building. Flash forward to two months later. I was taking the trash out one night around 11pm. While on the phone with my sister, I remember telling her that I was taking out the trash. Then I would be taking a shower afterwards before heading to a party. As I previously said, I always lock the door. Even just to take out the trash. Because of my lock being damaged, I only locked it once. When I got back to my apartment, I found the door unlocked, which immediately alarmed me. I went into the apartment and locked the door immediately, with all three different types of locks. For a bit of context, when you walk into my apartment, which is just 215 square feet, you have the main room in front of you, and the bathroom door immediately to your left. I had left the bathroom door slightly open, enough so I could see a man in my shower. He had his back turned to me. Naturally, when I saw this, I tried to open the door and leave as fast as possible. Except my main lock was damaged from two months earlier. I couldn't open it no matter how hard I tried. In this moment, all I could think of was the fact I had to leave as fast as possible. I jumped out of my window without really thinking. I figured it was the only solution I had. Except, I lived on the second floor. I hurt my ankles upon landing. I started running in whichever way I could. When I got a bit further from the building, I looked back, and the man was there at my window, watching me run away. I thought of two possible outcomes. Either the man was going to jump and chase me, but I wouldn't get far with my twisted ankles, or he would get scared of the height and be locked in my apartment. Thankfully, he picked option two. I went to hide in a bush a bit further and called the police, and they arrived within just 10 minutes because I lived so close to the station. They pushed my door and the man was there sitting on my couch, holding a knife, waiting for me to come back. They arrested him and told me he had a record. Attempted kidnapping and attempted murder were amongst a plethora of charges on him. They also told me how everything happened. Like I said, it was a very friendly neighborhood with mostly college students, so he got inside the building by other people holding the door for him. He then heard my sister telling me I was going to take a shower, which is why he was waiting in the bathroom for me. He crocheted my lock while I was taking out the trash. He apparently noticed me on school campus and followed me home several times before successfully getting in. He stayed inside waiting for me because I had recently changed my phone. The previous one was still on the table. So he thought I didn't have a phone to call the police. I don't live there anymore. But after that, to get into the building, we all need identification to prove we live there. Building IDs were created and we had to scan them every time. It was the only way to get inside the building. Nothing bad happened in the neighborhood after that. It's back to being very peaceful and friendly. Growing up as a teenager, it was just me and my mom that lived together. An important part of the story is the fact that our house was in the country, about 40 miles away from the big city we lived close to. When I started high school, I went to a private high school in New York, and my mom also worked in the city. For convenience, my mom bought a house in the city near my school and her work, but we kept the country house for weekends. It's also critical to know that this country house was in some fancy pants gated, secured, and patrolled neighborhood. 
It was a two-story house and we never went upstairs. Maybe once a year when my mom would host Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner at our house. The upstairs was an informal living area, a bar, a bathroom, and a game room. There just wasn't reason to go up there ever. The downstairs dining room and formal living room were absolutely off limits. I was never allowed to walk in there or go in there, unless it was a hosted dinner like Christmas or Thanksgiving. It was kept like a museum, oddly. I never really moved into the city house. I kept all of my clothes and belongings in the country house, because we still had all of our animals at the country house. I would drive home every day after school to do my homework, feed the animals, watch TV, and just do other shit around the house. After my homework was done, I would pack an overnight bag of clothes for the next day at school, and then drive to the city house. We did, however, spend all of our weekends back at home in the country house. One day, I came home after school, and I'm just putzing around the house. I finish my homework and animal duties, and then go pack my bags for the next day at school. My dresser drawers were really messed up, and things weren't really folded anymore. It looked as if someone was rummaging through my clothes. I honestly thought I must have messed up the last time I was packing clothes. I go to leave the house and there's a crystal ball turned over upside down on one of the living room tables. I'm shocked I even noticed. But I did, because everything in that room was kept in museum quality. I thought it was odd, but nothing more of it. I then went to the city house. The next day, I'm back at the country house after school. I finish my homework and animal duties. This time my closet seemed a bit in disarray. At this point, I think, holy shit, my mom came home in the middle of the day to see if I had drugs or something in my room, which I didn't. I wasn't into anything like that. However, when I was leaving the house, I noticed there was a second crystal ball turned over on one of the living room tables, right next to the first one. So this definitely stood out to me. I went into the room and completely surveyed it. Yes, for a fact. There are only two balls turned over upside down. I drive to the city house and ask my mom if she went through my room. She denies it and asks me, Do you think someone has been in the house? I say no, because, well, because nothing is missing. Plus, in the back of my head I'm thinking, it's in a gated, patrolled and secure neighborhood. The third day I go to school, and a girl younger than me at my private high school actually lives directly across the street from the country house. On the off chance we ever stayed the night there, I always drove her to school with me. She comes up to me and says, We saw you leaving your driveway this morning and we flashed our lights at you, but it was foggy so I guess you didn't see. At this point, I'm definitely thinking it's my mom going through my room, because my mom and I, at the time, drove matching white Mercedes cars. So I'm thinking my neighbor saw my mom's car leaving. I drive to the country house after school again. I walk in and immediately see a third ball turned upside down in the living room. Chills covered my entire body. I walked into my room. Bed sheets stripped. Pillowcases gone. So many things from my bookshelves were missing. It was completely ransacked. I immediately ran outside of the house and called my mom and then the police. The police showed up. My mom, who was driving to the house but still on the phone with me, asked me to go into a bedroom closet and look under the stack of jeans on her highest shelf. There was nothing there. It's apparently one of three places my mom kept her jewelry. She started sobbing. She then asked me to check under her underwear in the drawer. No, no jewelry there either. She asked me to check her armoire under her winter sweaters. No. Nothing there again. She's then hysterical at this point. She asked me to check under the stove, and once more, nothing. That's where she kept a heavy wooden box of silverware that her parents brought over from Sweden when they moved to America. Everything that was of considerable value or heritage was completely gone. Every little thing. All of it. The security gate had zero unauthorized visitors on their cameras, and none of them were in white Mercedes. The police did a full sweep of the house and identified a space in the upstairs game room. 
Someone had apparently been living there. There were soda cans in the attic space that's accessed through a small door in the upstairs bar. Apparently I'd been coming home as a 16 year old, while someone or multiple persons were living in our upstairs spaces and been doing a full scope of the house and all the assets to steal. To add insult to injury, my mother died unexpectedly about three weeks after the robbery happened. Anything at all of value of hers, or of heritage to my Swedish family, was gone. Everything. All gone. The insurance claim my father had to make turned out to be 480000 Now, the worst part. I'm 16 years old. Remember how my neighbor saw a white Mercedes coming out of our driveway? Well, the local police in the very small town that this country house was in, they tried to charge me with robbery and insurance fraud, assuming I took all the stuff from the house. It only lasted about two weeks, but it was intensely brutal. I cried pretty much nonstop. It was unending tears. My mother had just died and I was working with lawyers to fight my innocence against stealing valuable family assets or heirlooms. When I was in high school, I had a friend Lisa and a second friend Zoe. Lisa had a lot of money, and her huge house was located next to our high school. So every time we had a break or anything, the three of us would go there, we would have a lot of sleepovers at our house. It was this huge rich people house, so it was awesome to stay there. So one day, we decided to stay the night there, the three of us, plus Lisa's little sister, Anna. Their mother was gone for the night. We decided to put on some PJs and watch scary movies for hours. Anna went to bed before us. We just stayed in the living room watching TV. At one point, the alarm goes off. It happens sometimes, so Lisa just goes to turn it off, and that was it. But then about ten minutes later, the alarm goes off again, and it scared us. Technically, the alarm was made to ring only when humans come by. Due to the fact that the house was located in the middle of a forest, we all knew that sometimes animals would come by the house. So when the alarm was installed, it was calibrated for people only. And that was the second time it rang. We started to get a bit scared. We went upstairs and opened the windows to look at the garden all around the house. There was nothing. We even went on the balcony in the middle of the night. Nothing. I was alone on the balcony at some point, and the alarm went off again. The automatic lights around the swimming pool turned on. That meant something was around the pool, and I was just above it. I got so scared I got on my knees. I stayed there until my friend deactivated the alarm and the lights, and then I ran inside the house. At this point, we were really, really scared. We started thinking about what it could be. If it has to be any person, all of our lights were on, so they knew we were home. We turned all the lights off, and all four of us went hiding downstairs in the kitchen. We didn't have our phones on us, so there we were, Lights off, scared in a huge house, with windows everywhere we could see, and then the alarm went berserk again. Anna screamed, Lisa took off with her, reassuring her while walking to shut off the alarm again, as if it was going to be off once and for all. I was in the kitchen with Zoe, all we could do was look around. There was one point where we heard footsteps right beside us. It was like it was on the other side of the wall in the garden. It was fast. It sounded like the person knew where they were going. We just froze, sitting in the dark. We jumped when something, well someone, it was obvious, walked right by the door in front of us. The person had a light, but there was a second light that allowed us to see this guy's silhouette. That meant there were two people, running around the house for at least 20 minutes. Me and Zoe were still not moving. The other two that had gone upstairs were so scared that they stayed there. Suddenly, we heard a voice, and then a second one. I wasn't able to understand anything, but I heard it. Zoe and I were blinded by a sudden light right in our faces. We were frozen, 
Not able to move, scream, or talk, the light stayed on. Someone saw us through the blinds. Someone was watching us. Suddenly we heard the sound of the front door. That snapped me out of it. Zoe still didn't move at all, but I crawled to the back door and closed the blinds. I sat in front of the door to hold it in place in case the guy on the other side tried to force it open. The person at the front door was still trying to open it. Zoe was still frozen in fear, and the two girls upstairs doing God knows what. Suddenly, the guy at the back door started hitting it, trying to force it open. I grabbed the handle and tried to keep it closed, all the while he was just hitting the door and trying to open it. It felt like it lasted hours, but in reality, it was only seconds. At one point, the man at the front door stopped, and shortly after, the one trying the back door stopped as well. I saw two lights moving fast and eventually faded. Still overwhelmed with fear and just staying near the door to block it, Zoe and I just slept in the kitchen. The other two girls upstairs. Nothing happened at all. It was all over with. The next day Lisa and Anna's mom came back home. We told her everything. We got yelled at because we didn't call the cops. Their mother took it upon herself and called them. The police investigated the area and discovered footsteps all around the house. They also found some muddy footprints on the front door, but that was about it. They told us it must have been some guys who were just doing some reconnaissance, that they were just walking around houses to see how to rob them. It was common in this area. There was a lot of really big and beautiful houses, filled with expensive things. The only thing I will never be able to understand is why they started being so aggressive. Originally, they were just walking around the house, but I think if they were just observing, then they would have left when they realized we were inside. Or at least left when the guy saw us in the kitchen. The moment they saw us in the kitchen, they started banging and trying to force the doors open to get in the house. I don't know if they really wanted to rob the house. I don't think I will know. And honestly, I don't think I want to. I didn't spend any more nights at the house. I was too scared they would come back again. Lisa got a bit angry, and it was like she didn't understand. But from what she told Zoe and I, she didn't see them. She just stayed upstairs with her sister. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you don't mind, drop a like and comment. Subscribe too if you haven't and share my videos so we can keep up the astronomical growth. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons for supporting the channel, so a huge thanks to Brenda, Astara Rain, Rudy, Rochelle, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire05, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. If you fancy checking out my Patreon, Twitter, or Reddit, all my links are in the description. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you're all doing well and had a great start to the week. And with that, I'll see you on the next one.